Welcome to another AWS networking session of Build Day TV. Jeffrey Powers here, and as always, I have my good friend and colleague, Mr. Alistair Cook, right next to me. How are you doing, Alistair? I'm good this morning, Jeffrey. It's uh, at least sunny here in, in New Zealand. It's the middle of winter, so the wind's blowing and the rain is falling as well, but the sun is shining while the rain falls. That's awesome. I wish I had my winters. My, yeah, my winters like your winters or your. Oh yeah, yeah. It would be nice. It would be nice. So, so last time we talked about the elastic load balancing, uh, and what what are we working on today? So today we're going to look at how you set up networking on AWS and in virtual private cloud for high availability. And I introduced load balancing in the last episode because it's one of the techniques we use to actually deliver the application high availability on top of the network high availability. I'm going to focus on network, but when we get hands on, we'll actually build out a, a load balancer across uh, a, a highly redundant environment. Sounds good. Let's get at it. One of the fundamental ideas that I keep coming back to as I talk about AWS is this quote from Werner Vogels, that everything fails all the time. And this is one of the guiding ideas underneath uh, how you approach architecture on AWS. And essentially, your application shouldn't fail just because something underneath it fails. This is a really common design practice all across AWS is things are going to fail and your application sh should continue to operate. And so we need to deliver an application that's going to, to continue to operate if there are going to be some failures under it. Okay. And so one of the levels of availability is around this thing called availability zones. Funnily enough, with availability in the name, they're very related. And AWS has this idea of an availability zone that is a cluster of data centers. Might be one data center, it might be multiple, but they're all very close together and they're connected by a very fast, very low latency network. And from our point of view as, as the users of this infrastructure, they're our smallest unit. We just treat an availability zone as if it were one data center because we can't tell whether there's one physical data center or there's a group of data centers. Okay. But we do know it's fast, low latency network. And we also know that availability zone is the scope for some services. And when I talk about scope for service, this is where when you define an object, how far can it move? Where does it exist? And so services like EC2, the virtual machine service, are scoped at an availability zone. A single virtual machine lives inside a single availability zone. So if that availability zone fails, that virtual machine is unavailable. Can you say that again? So the virtual machine lives inside an availability zone. Okay. If the availability zone fails, and everything fails, that particular virtual machine is unavailable. Okay, got it. So this is why we want multiple availability zones to provide us better availability. Yeah. Now, the same thing applies for the storage for your virtual machine as well. And, and this combination of the EC2 compute service and the Elastic Block storage for your virtual machine, the virtual machine side drives, they're both scoped at a single availability zone. All right. And we have clusters of availability zones called regions. We can talk more about the infrastructure underneath another time, but AWS talks about regions and has them spread around the world. And each region contains typically three availability zones. All right. And they're quite close together, 100-ish miles range, but they are separate in their sort of failure uh, scopes. So that if a particular availability zone in a region fails, so in, for example, Sydney, which is my nearest region, there are three availability zones. If there's a failure in one of the availability zones, it doesn't affect the other availability zones. And so a region is a, a scope for an application for us, and it's the way we abstract out those individual availability zones is with a regional service. Okay. So what this looks like uh, is we're doing our network design is that the subnet lives inside an availability zone. So our virtual private cloud service is a regional service, but so far we've just built inside a single availability zone. What we're going to do is take this subnet that lives in one availability zone and replicate it into another availability zone. So it's gonna have the same function, but it has to have a different IP address range. Okay. So we had a public subnet in one availability zone, we'll have a public subnet in another availability zone. Got it. Nicely, the internet gateway, which is an AWS managed service that provides internet access from our VPC and to our VPC, it's a regional service. We don't need to worry about making that highly available. AWS does that for us. 
but we do need net gateways. We were putting a net gateway into a public subnet to allow a private subnet access to the internet. You'll remember that from our very first video in the series. Yes. Uh, that lives inside an availability zone. Now, under the covers, that net gateway is essentially EC2. So AWS users manage DC2 instances to provide that NAT gateway. Okay. And so they live in a single subnet, single availability zone. OK. And then we also mirror our route tables. You recall that we had in the public subnet a route table that pointed to the internet gateway. That one we can reuse across the availability zones. But in the private subnet, we had a route table that pointed to the NAT gateway. That has to stay within the availability zone. So we have to have multiple route tables for the multiple availability zones. So we started out before with this scenario. This is what we built in the first episode, where we have two subnets in a single availability zone. We have a NAT gateway, we have an internet gateway, we have route tables. All right. What we're going to add to that is mirrors of those two subnets. So now in a different availability zone, we're going to have a different public subnet. And you can see that the third octet, the third number in the CIDR range is different. We're going to have another private subnet as well. All right. So all of these fit inside the range of our VPC. And of course, then once we've created the subnets, we're also going to create an additional NAT gateway and additional route tables. OK. So that's what's required for us to replicate out our infrastructure from one availability zone to another and provides us a network that is redundant across multiple availability zones, gives us high availability for the network. Now, we still need to build an application on top of that. And we're going to use a regional service to provide high availability. That regional service's job is to abstract away the availability zones underneath and deliver us a service that's independent of a specific availability zone. All right. And we talked about the elastic load balancer. That's the most common way of abstracting away a bunch of usually EC2 virtual machines. Network connections come in, they're distributed across a group behind. And that's what we'll show in, in the actual hands-on when we have a play with this. But there are a bunch of other services. We could use DynamoDB, which is a database service. We could use the simple queue service, the simple storage service, S3, or the simple notification service. There are a number of ways that we can abstract away those EC2 instances that live in those availability zones with services that run at a regional scope. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but the most common one is that elastic load balancer. And so we end up building a highly available website. So sitting on top of our replicated pair of subnets, two public, two private, we then have an elastic load balancer. That's a regional service. And behind that, we have two EC2 instances Take it, take it back, machines. taking it back one step to uh, uh, one page, uh, go back one slide. So does it matter what you're building is what you use or does that matter at all? So of these regional services that provide high availability, they're all very much part of your application. Okay. So this is very much the application design in here. So the elastic load balancer is going to be used where you have something like a website something that's going to be a synchronous, um, real-time connection. Okay. Uh, you might use this, the simple storage service, S3, as a, a regional service for high availability, that, that when objects are uploaded into the S3 service by one part of your application, that triggers an event. It might be a, a Lambda function. It might be an EC2 instance that looks at the S3 service All right. and acts on that. Okay. So this is very much inside of your application architecture. And we're designing our network architecture to accommodate the application. All right. OK, perfect. Yeah. And that's why our top example is this one, that elastic load balancer in the front, a couple of EC2 instances sitting in the back that are providing that highly available website. Now, the two EC2 instances have to be exactly the same, interchangeable. They also usually are disposable. Uh, we usually have some automation, usually with an auto-scaling group, in order to create these EC2 instances. OK. Uh, but from the network design point of view, it doesn't really matter how these EC2 instances are being created and removed. It's just that the usual practice is that there's some automation for that. And in the next video, we will go hands-on and we'll build this out. So we will build out a highly available website sitting on top of these redundant uh, subnets sitting across multiple availability zones. All right. 
So, Jeffrey, that was what I wanted to talk about with VPC high availability. Are there any more thoughts and questions you had at this time? Uh, looks pretty uh, straightforward. It's just basically uh, setting up something for uh, for replication and uh, and use. If if one of availability zone is not functioning, it'll send you to the other one. Yeah, and you know, AWS says they've never had a complete failure of an availability zone, but you should design for that failure. What they have had is single services failing at availability zone scope. So there have been a few failures where the Elastic Block Store service has failed for a particular availability zone. And okay. as a consequence, every EC2 instance in that availability zone isn't running or some set of EC2 instances. So the idea that a EC2 instance, a virtual machine, is going to be always available is really common on premises but it's not the case on AWS. And we expect that EC2 instance might go down at times and we need our application to continue to operate. This is a high, high availability component. How many availability zones should you plan for when you're uh, building just, let's say, a website? So it really depends on the scale of your environment. So this scenario here where I've got just two availability zones in use, that would be our minimum because then we're immune to a failure of one availability zone. Okay. But we also need to think about the blast radius of that failure. So if I'm using two availability zones and one of them fails, I've lost half of my resources. Most regions have at least three availability zones. The majority of AWS regions have three. Okay. Uh, there's one with four, that's in Tokyo, and North Virginia has six. Wow. So depending upon how much scale you need, you will typically use more. If you have a service that requires 15 EC2 instances, you're probably going to spread that across three availability zones. All right. Because then if one fails, you've only lost five EC2 instances. And the recovery from that is going to be quicker. And I'm assuming... So it depends on your application architecture. Yeah. And I'm assuming that the cost will then, every time you add an availability zone, it, it's not doubling, but it's uh, whatever the, the uh, size and usage of the first zone is, double that for a second zone and triple that for a third zone. Well, you know, the good thing is there's no charge for the subnet. There's no charge for the VPC itself. The additional charge you get for a new availability zone in this scenario would be an additional NAT gateway running in the additional availability zone. Okay. But if I needed 15 EC2 instances for my application, those EC2 instances cost me the same if they're all jammed into one availability zone or if they're spread across three availability zones. The actual EC2 cost, which oh. is usually the biggest cost, okay. is the same no matter how many availability zones they use. Okay. So if it, you. It does get more complicated, but yeah. in general, adding another availability zone is a small increase in cost. Okay. So I should think of it as if I'm in New Zealand and I start a pizza place, chances of anybody looking at my pizza place outside of New Zealand are pretty small. Uh, so I'd have two availability zones uh, if there is two in, in the New Zealand area or wherever you connect to. Uh, but then if I want, if I have something more global, I'd want to have uh, availability zones, at least two in different areas so they can be accessed, right? So let, let's be clear that availability zones live within a region. Our region and here yeah. in New Zealand, there is no AWS region. My nearest region is Sydney. Okay. And so um, the three availability zones in Sydney I would use for my application, and I would scale within the Sydney region for whatever the load was going to be there. If I have, let's say it is a pizza shop in New Zealand, and I've got 100,000 potential customers who are connecting to the website, I probably only need four web servers. But if it was, for example, the uh, website for the largest pizza chain in the United States, yeah, I'd probably need more than that. I'm probably going to have West Coast and East Coast US regions in use. That's a very different architecture than putting everything inside one region. Okay. Uh, so region to region availability is, is an interesting design challenge. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a little beyond what I wanted to cover here. I wanted to start with the basics of when you, you're thinking about building a network on premises, you're used to having a highly reliable single network for your, um, for your data center. And the idea that your application by default should span multiple data centers is not common on premises. Okay. But on AWS, it's absolutely standard that we span multiple availability zones for our applications. Okay. So we'll only stick to the region and not go globally with your pizza place. So. 
we can go global with the pizza place later. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, so what's next then? So next, we're going to go and build this. Awesome. Uh, next video, we're going to go and uh, build out highly available infrastructure. We're going to build a highly available website on top of it and look at what happens when something fails. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do that. You can see the uh, next video on uh, on YouTube. Just uh, head to the playlist if you want to. Go ahead and subscribe. There's a playlist that you can go down, and it'll be the next video on that playlist. Otherwise, go over to builddaylive.com, and you'll uh, find the videos there. You've been watching uh, part one of AWS Networking uh, for a VPC high availability. We'll see you at the next one.